All right. Welcome back to the KO'd Convo with Keenan O'Doherty. And I am truly honored to have my next guest with me, Vita Blue, former Major League pitcher, Bay Area, Bay Area zone pretty much, hailing from uh, Mansfield, Louisiana. That's very good. Cy Young, Cy Young, Cy Young Award winner, three-time World Series champion uh, with the Oakland Athletics, and then he also moved across the Bay to the San Francisco Giants. So you've been uh, you've been in the Bay Area a long time, my man. Yes, I have. I'm a, a true transplant. I think I uh, originally moved to the Bay Area in 1974 after I had a couple of years in the majors and had a little confidence in myself that I was going to stay. And I purchased a resident and I think I've got an apartment in Alameda and I stayed there for a couple of years and I finally got another raise and felt a little bit more confidence and I bought a home in the Oakland Hills. <laughs> but it's, it's been a, a great run. I, uh, I feel like I'm a Bay Area local. Uh, I've seen, you know, both sides, the, the uh, San Francisco side and, of course, the Oakland side with my years with A's and getting traded to the Giants. But I, I'm a Bay Area fan. I, I love the area. It's great weather. Uh, get all the seasons uh, except for the fire season. That's not a fun time for none of us. But uh, um, I think I made my mark in the Bay Area. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's it's certainly a, a ever-changing area. That's That's for sure. So... Uh, but you're not from the Bay Area. You're from Louisiana. So let's let's start at the beginning a little bit. Where did your love for the sport of baseball come from, or, or where did it grow out of? Actually, it just came about as being in the summer leagues, playing summer ball in the in the parks and rec. Actually, I was playing softball, and uh, my high school didn't even have a team, have a baseball team, but. My, one of my high school football coaches said he would coach a team if enough kids came out. And I was one of the kids that came out, even though I was a quarterback on the football team, I didn't want to pitch. I wanted to be a left-handed Willie Mays and play center field. So I played center field, played a little right field, and played a lot of first base. And uh, in some kind of way, they asked me to pitch. I'm like, come on, man. And um, then I got got to uh, play in high school, like I said, and, and uh, I had a strong arm from throwing from the outfield to the base. I think that's what influenced them to ask me to pitch. And uh, as they say, the rest is history. And, uh, you know, after I got into the pros and to the professional ranks. And of course, once I made it to the major leagues, I found out that the pitching position was the highest paid position. So I'm like, now we're talking. <laughs> so, uh, as I said, uh, and I learned the art of pitching, I guess, from um, just watching other guys. I was a big Sandy Koufax fan, a big Whitey Ford fan. and uh, But we just recently lost one of the greatest pitchers of all time, and that was Bob Gibson. And, you know, I said I want to be a left-handed Willie Mays. So I probably wanted to design myself to being a left-handed Bob Gibson, too, because he was a fierce competitor. And uh, he threw the ball hard. He would overpower hitters. And... Uh, I think that's where I adopted my style of pitching from. Uh, and uh, his motto was hard as he could, as long as he could. And I, I went by that same mantra. Right on, right on. So you made your uh, major league debut. I, I, I want to kind of set the scene for you a little bit. It's July 20th, 1969, Anaheim Stadium, your debut. If you could remember what it was like, what, stepping onto the mound for the first time, like just the whole experience of the of your first major league game? Well, obviously you're in a bigger stadium than you've ever been in uh, as far as uh, the crowd capacity goes, the uh, uh, fan capacity. Um, I don't know, I probably had the old deer in the headlight syndrome and I just went out there trying to prove that I belonged. Uh, I do recall that it was the same day that man landed on the moon and uh, that's some something historic other than me pitching a baseball game. But I also remember I got thrown out of the game. I thought I was a pretty decent hitter. And the umpire called a pitch that I thought was not a strike. And I said something. And I slung my bat to the to the screen right behind on plate. And some kind of way, he, I looked around and said, you're out of here. I'm not even sure what my numbers were based on the. So at least I must have pitched three innings because at least I came to bat. 
So I'm not sure what my numbers were for my first original major of uh, a uh, major league start, but uh, uh, it was the beginning of a great career. So I learned my lesson and when it comes to uh, when it came to uh, insulting umpires, and uh, I knew how to ask where was the pitch at on the mound, and uh, and uh, some umpires don't like you asking them anything because they they say it's they're being shown up. But there's a way to, to, you know, just, hey, where was that pitch, man? Was that, are you going to call that a strike ever today? And that's what I would secretly ask them when I would go, uh, when I was still hitting prior to the start of the designated hitter. But uh, um, I did hit four home runs, but uh, I got paid to pitch. And uh, I never put a lot of emphasis on hitting. I, I just enjoyed hitting and batting practice. But I need a take sign. And the bunt side, which was most important for a pitcher to know as far as his offensive prowess goes. What, were you, did you like hitting from the right side or the left side more? I batted left-handed. I do switch it. I am a switch it. I play golf right-handed. I do everything right-handed but throw. And uh, I shoot pool right-handed. Uh, I play tennis right-handed. I play ping pong, back, uh, back midden. Um, what else? I do, I'm right-sided, right-handed dominant, except throwing. I punt a football. When I was in high school, I punted a football. I punted that with my right foot. So uh, some kind of way, I uh, I became right-handed. I was left-handed in a right-handed's body. <laughs> well, you're categorized as a switch hitter, and I don't know if you know this, but you're the last American, American League switch hitting MVP. Exactly. You must have heard it a couple times, huh? <laughs> I have. I've heard it in sports bars and uh, and just in bars in general. But uh, it's a pretty good trivia question. And most people say it's, uh, they say Reggie, Reggie Smith, Pete Rose, Eddie Murray. But uh, it's Vita Blue yeah. from the American League. Yeah, there's a lot of National League guys, but from the American League, he... yeah. You're the last one standing for now. Um, so you made your debut at 19 years old, and then you really hit it off uh, during when you were around 21. Uh, the 1971 season, that was the year you won Cy Young and AL MVP. Uh -huh. Did you always have, like, the same routine, pregame routine or postgame routine um, that helped you succeed that season, or...? No, I was just a new kid on the block, uh, applying my skills. Uh, and the, the key to the whole thing is I was given an opportunity to make the roster, and I did. Uh, the A's had a good young team at that time, and they were just building themselves into a championship team. I just happened to be one of the missing pieces of the puzzle. Uh, um, i tell you one thing that happened. I went to – I was in the Army Reserves because uh, during my uh, – uh, early years of my 20s, the Vietnam War conflict was still going on. So a lot of the players, a lot of athletes, period, they, uh, the teams put them in the National Guard or the Reserve. So I was Army Reservist. And prior to the 71 season, I went to uh, the winter of 1970. I went to basic training at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. It's a home of the, uh, what is that, the 82nd Airborne. So I got myself in the best shape that I could ever be in, and I attribute that to boot camp. So I left boot camp, and I went straight, went to my mom's house for a week or two back at to Louisiana, and I left and went straight to spring training. And uh, um, like I said, I thought I was in the best shape that I'd ever been in, and spring training was a piece of cake compared to running with, with a backpack and some boots on, you know, two or three miles twice a week back and forth. So I attribute that to uh, to my success in 1971. And of course, uh, you know, when you're a new kid on the block, you establish yourself. And by the time I had seen the, the whole league, uh, I had won my share of games. And uh, I'm very flattered and honored to have won the Cy Young Award. And thinking back about it now, I did put a lot of hard work into it. So the results of, of uh, the hard work I put in, the, the results of that was was winning the Cy Young and MVP and uh, making an all-star game and being a 20-game winner and, and pitching 300 innings and having 300 strikeouts. So uh, it was a banner year. But then you learned that at the pro level, you can set the bar so high that 
you know, what are you going to do as an encore for this? And unfortunately for me in 70, uh, the 1970, start of 1972 season, number one, there was a strike or work stoppage, as some people like to call it. And I was uh, holding out for more money because in 1971, the minimum salary was 14700 something, I think. So um, I, you know, I, I sit here and watch TV today and, and, and the, the commentators talk about a guy's career and they talk about how a guy hit, you know, 320 and hit 40 home runs and they get, get these lucrative contracts, the multi-year contracts. And, uh, and I think about if I could be Vita Blue today in today's market, be 24 and 8 with a 1.82 ERA, 300 strikeouts, like I could say, 300 some innings pitch, uh, 24 complete games, eight shutouts, and uh, and the works. You know the you know the drill. How what type of contract would I have gotten that you know you get paid for what you did last year? So in '72, you would think that. Under normal, cir normal circumstance, I would have gotten a multi-year contract. But I worked for this guy named Charlie Finley, and he was notorious for not paying anybody. Front office personnel, less known the baseball players who was making him a lot of money to put in his pocket. But uh, this here nor there, it's just one of those things that happened. But, you know, you sit there, and I do sit there, and I flashback about how, would, how different would my life be? And as I've gotten old, I realized that the money is a great thing to have, but I, you know, I realized that I make me happy and not the, the, the money allows me to, to have certain things, but does it make you overall happy? I found out that it does it. It's nice to have, but it, it, it's not the key to my happiness as I found out, like I said. Right, right. And I mean, to be honest with you, you might have to warm your arm back up because you might as well just be the $500 million man. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I'll take half of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, uh, 70, 72, 73, 74, right? A's dynasty, uh -huh. three right. championships. Is there one, one of those three that really stuck out to you as, as more special than the others? Well, the first one is always the, the most, at least to me, I, I was proud of that one. And of course, that's what you go to camp for. You, you go to get yourself in shape to be, to be on a team and you want to be the best team, you want to be the best player you can be but to win the championship in 1972 and beat a great Cincinnati Reds big red machine with the likes of Pete Rose and Johnny Bench and Tony Perez and unfortunately the late Joe Morgan uh, Ken Griffey uh, uh, Cesar Geronimo George Foster was on the team and uh, did I mention Johnny Bench but uh, we played them tough and uh, I think our pitching neutralize their hitting and of course good pitching always stops good hitting that's that's a given but um yeah the first one is always the the uh, most important one to me at least and of course again the owner of the team charlie finley was uh was the architect of that putting a putting together a good group of young players and uh we had gotten beaten in 1971 by the Baltimore Orioles. They beat us to go and play the New York Mets, I think it was, in 1970, or Pittsburgh. Yeah, I think Pittsburgh. I'm, my bad. So um, we got beat by the Orioles, but we felt that we could compete with, with any team in the league, in the majors, less known the American League. So we bounced back in 72 and won the championship. And, uh, uh, Again, Mr. Finley was Irish, and uh, he put a shamrock on our on our on our ring. And on the ring, there's a formula. He had this formula all the time that says S plus S equals S, and that's on our ring, if I'm not mistaken. But the formula is the key to the formula is sweat plus sacrifice equals success. How cool is that? And uh, I'm proud of the 1972 season. Uh, the 1972 team with the likes of, well, Reggie Jackson got injured in the playoffs in Detroit. And uh, so we were, we beat Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Reds without Reggie Jackson, which is a tip of the cap to those guys again, like I mentioned, uh, with the likes of a Catfish Hunter and a Daryl Nose and a Gene Tennyson and a Dick Green and a Sal Bando and a Burry Campanaris and a Ken Hostman. 
and the Raleigh Fingers and uh, those guys are the nucleus, were the nucleus of our ball team at that time. And uh, I just happened to be there to be a part of the puzzle, man. <laughs> Let me uh, remind the listeners here that you did get revenge against the Orioles in 73 in the uh, ALCS. Playoffs. Yes, we did. Complete game shutout in, uh, in game three. I but, think I was matched up against, was it against Jim Palmer? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, uh, that, that's a tough pitching matchup. Jim, Jim Palmer was a hell of a pitcher in his own right. But, um, so yeah, let's talk about the, that whole pitching core, right? You, you got yourself, you got Raleigh, you got Catfish. Was there just a the chemistry between all you guys in the pitching room that was just incomparable? Yeah, normally on the ball teams, uh, infielders hang out with infielders, outfielders hang out with outfielders, starting pitchers hang out with starting pitchers, relievers hang out with relievers, catchers hang out with catchers. So, but you build that bond amongst yourselves, and uh, you're constantly talking about, uh, you know, if Catfish Hunter was pitching today, even though I'm left-handed, you know, I might through the course of a game asked him how he pitch a certain hitter in the lineup that day knowing that I, that same guy, I would be facing him, even though I'm left-handed. So you share trade secrets all the time amongst yourselves. And yes, that, there was always a bond amongst our, our core of guys, uh, individually by positions, like I said. Right. Did, uh, did you, did you get any, any, uh, bad rap, uh, from your former teammates once you switched across the Bay to the Giants? No, uh, trades are a part of the business. And, uh, I, I consider myself to have gotten lucky to have stayed in the Bay Area. I had just uh, purchased a residence here in, in the Oakland Hills. And uh, to stay in the Bay Area, it was, I mean, the crossroads to the east, I mean, the West Bay was, it was somewhat of a blessing in disguise. And, and the Giants had a great young team at that time, too, at 7 8. And I just tried to fit right in with the core group that they had with Bob Nepper and uh, young Jack Clark at that time and uh, Larry Herndon and Terry Whitfield. Uh, they had a great young team and didn't realize how good they were. Right. Um, so post, post career, right? You've stayed in the barrier. You've done a lot of charitable work, especially with the uh, Northern Light School. Um, and if I'm correct, and help me out with this, you have a, uh, you have sort of a charitable cause going here called Step Up to the Plate for Northern Light School. Why don't you go ahead and, and talk about that a little bit? Well, we have two events that we are able to uh, to have this year. We have a big gala, but we uh, it's one of our biggest fundraisers. And of course, we do a golf tournament. So besides of that, we're trying to uh, raise as much money as we can. Times are hard and uh, we understand that. But, you know, any donation to the cause is a help. We are the kids that we... Uh, raise money for our very underserved in our community, but I got to give a tip of the cap to Northern Life School and the founder itself. You saw Miss Michelle Lewis and uh, she's done a good job of it, but uh, we're just reaching out to the general public. Uh, there's some good things that we have. We have a Vita Blue Mint, we have some spikes. Uh, and uh, of course I use, I'm a avid golfer. So we have a couple of rounds of golf that we put on our list that can be bid it on and uh, hopefully our folks will reach out. And thanks for allowing me to talk about that. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. And you've always been, uh, I've, I've always heard you've been good with the kids. What do you think, how important do you think the uh, teaching of the baseball game to the, to this young generation is? Well, there are two things. Uh, you all, at least for me, I always want to teach and share my thoughts and feelings about the game of baseball. It, in my opinion, not because I played it, it's the greatest game that we have. America's game, as it referred to on the uh, networks. But uh, anytime I can share my thoughts with an amateur player, a collegiate player, uh, it's always, uh, it's, it's very fulfilling for me to talk about how I did what I did when I was playing. But you'd be surprised that uh, the high schools and the colleges are doing a good job of teaching the kids and the parks and rec departments too. They're doing a good job of teaching the kids. And uh, even though the African-American community is not, have not, has not gravitated to baseball, I still think it's a great sport. And they, I, I still reach out to, to the African-American African community if and when I can 
or if and when they ever call and ask me to do something in that regard. Right. Is there one pitch that you wish you had worked on more in your arsenal? Uh, yeah. Actually, I probably think I should have thrown more change-ups, and I think that would have complemented being a uh, power pitcher. And it's just the opposite of what you're doing. You throw a pitch hard and you throw a pitch slow, and the key to that is trying to offset the, the timing of the hitter, and that is the art of pitching at its best to be able to change speeds, to be able to throw the ball inside, to throw it outside, throw it high, throw it low. And let's know, you know, throwing the ball down the middle of the plate all the time. But as a young pitcher, you know, I thought that I had to throw the ball down the middle of the plate. There are times when you don't want to throw a strike, you know, when you have a two strike, no ball count. As you watch the catches, a lot of times on the telecast, the catches in a half squat, he's trying to throw that high fastball or that high pitch, whatever he might have called to uh, offset the, uh, the sight line for the batter. But uh, it, it took me a while to get comfortable with the art of pitching itself. And uh, uh, with the help of the good Lord, I was stayed health enough to play 17 years. And I really enjoyed every minute of it. Well, 17 years is a, a long time. Long, long time. <laughs> Long, I don't see a lot of current players playing 17 years, but a you, lot of spring trainers, a lot of trips to Phoenix, and uh, and uh, like, well, that was the other good part about getting traded to the Giants. You know, they both trained in Arizona, and uh, it was like just changing stadium. That was about all I did because uh, I pitched against the Giants when I was in spring training with days, and of course. When I got traded to the Giants, I pitched against the A's a couple of times when I was in spring training with the Giants. But uh, I really enjoyed the Scottsdale, Mesa, Phoenix area. And of course, the Giants had their triple A team there for a number of years. So we kind of fit right in there uh, in the Phoenix area. But uh, hey, man, I'm still very lucky to have gotten a chance to do something that I enjoyed doing. Uh, and I didn't think of baseball as a job, you know, it gave me a chance to travel, first class travel and uh, made teammates for life. I played ball with guys from Dominican, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, Cuba, Panama, Mexico. So guys from around the world, I mean, all over the country, all over the world. And I played with Italian players, uh, Polish players, French players, Jewish players, African American players, Native American players. So, you know, my baseball family tree reaches all segments in all parts of the world, man. And how cool is that? That is amazing. And I, and I bet you didn't dream about it when, when you were coming out of No, the I didn't. It, it, it was, uh, I didn't think of of it in those terms until I got, as I got older and I got out of the game and how rich my life has been defined by experiencing all those things with all those different people. And uh, I've done some stuff with the USO tours. Uh, I've gone to uh, Korea, Japan, Germany to uh, visit the troops and uh, do clinics and play softball games with our troops all over the world. So that's pretty cool too, having been a uh, military person myself for six years. Very cool, very cool. One one last question for you, Vida. In in terms of the state of the uh, MLB right now, because you got all this technology now and all this analytics that you you didn't have back when you were playing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> what what do you think of the state of the MLB right now? It drives me crazy. That exit velocity that spin rate, that it just drives me wacko. That little box on the on the screen with the hitter, I mean, yeah, if that's in front of the hitter, it drives me crazy. I understand it, the analytics of it and all that stuff. I think just good old fashioned hardball is, is what I grew up on. So obviously that I haven't learned the, the, about the technology. You know, as a pitcher, I don't need to know the distance. Uh, the exit velocity of a pitch that I threw to a guy 100 miles per hour, and they come back and show me. I mean, I I get it, but I don't get it. It's it's fan driven. The technology is there, and you. But just the fact that uh, I, I I hope they never go to the 
to the automated umpire. It's, I still think the human factor is a big part of, of the game of baseball. And, uh, you know, the position that I played is the truest form of defense, starting pitching. I mean, it's great that guys can leap and rob home runs and climb the wall and make diving catches in place, but the truest form of defense is that starting pitcher on that mound, 60 feet, six inches away from the hitter. Uh, you know, a lot of times when I do watch the game, sometimes I, I mute the volume and just just kind of analyze the game myself. But all this scroll comes up on the screen about the exit velocity and uh, the distance, and they show the graphics and they'll overlay of of the home run that's hit in Dodger Stadium compared to what it w- would have been in at the Oakland Coliseum. I'm like, it's out of the park. It's over the fence, man. Who cares? But I guess you probably – are you a fan, big fan of the technology? I mean, uh, it's – I mean, there's a lot of things to follow with it. I mean, sometimes, yeah. there, I'm, sometimes I think there's a better uh, – I think it's better just to enjoy the game as it is because at the end of Thank the you baseball game but uh, I mean I, if it helps some people then all for it but I think although the I, I do I do think the automated umpires thing is a little bogus I, I, well there's one thing I do like the, the replays oh we're sorry well I'm, I'm house sitting here we we have the uh they have the video to get the calls correct uh, you know foul balls shoulder base and all that stuff I think that's a big that's that's a great application of the technology. Other than that, I think it's all the human factor still has to be a part of it. Right, right. Well, Vita Blue, I am so honored to to have you on the KO Convo. It was awesome.